Welcome to the Peace One Day celebration. It's the 21st of September and we're at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. And I'm joined by an extraordinary panel who you're obviously going to speak to, you know, in a moment. Um, this is all about cyber non-violence. You know, Peace One Day started, you know, a long time ago. And, you know, at that point, the cyber world isn't, wasn't really something that we were thinking about. But before we get into more detail, I would like to take this opportunity to, th to thank three companies. Digitalis, uh, Social360 and Signal AI. These guys are helping us measure everything that's going on today in the cyber world. And I find that just like, absolutely fascinating that we can look at how people are searching, what they're doing, what the trends are, what sort of usage of social media there is, how many hits on the website, etc. And that information will be being broadcast throughout the day. But for those who have just tuned in, we had an amazing panel take a stand earlier with an extraordinary group of people that you can see on the Peace One Day YouTube channel. But for you who's just arrived, I just want to let you know that this began 20 years ago. And that's why we're here at Shakespeare. Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. 20 years ago, we began a journey to create a day of peace, a day of ceasefire and non-violence with a fixed calendar date, the 21st of September. And of course, 20 years ago, I, I had no idea that that would happen. But after years of travelling, I'm delighted to let you know that all the member states of the United Nations unanimously chose the 21st of September as the world's day of peace. Incredible. Then what we did, having established it with a fixed calendar date, the peace day, we went into Afghanistan to see if we could be a part of a manoeuvring, a ceasefire, where everyone would become involved, including the Taliban. You know, and that was successful. NATO, ISAF, uh, the United Nations, uh, Karzai, uh, you know, the, the Taliban, everyone was involved. And as a consequence of that, 1.4 million children were vaccinated against polio on the 21st of September as a consequence of that ceasefire, which was amazing. After that part happened, we then went around the world trying to institutionalize the day, to tell people about it. And the reason we want to tell people about it is that 95% of the violence that will happen today is going to happen in our homes, communities, schools, and places of work. Five, probably, probably approximately 5% is going to happen in an area of conflict. And that's absolutely incredible. Therefore, you and I, we all have a role to play in the manifestation of a more peaceful and sustainable world. And a new area of conflict, of course, is the cyber world. The, the, the sexism, the, the, the bullying, uh, the harassment, the, the violent images. I mean, this is a serious issue. We have to take this very seriously in relation to what it's doing to people's mental state. I mean, we, you know, we've just got to look at it. We've got to talk about it. And in fact, what we've got to try and do is decrease violence in the cyberspace. Hashtag cyber nonviolence. So let me now introduce you to some people who are going to debate that and discuss it and they are absolutely incredible individuals and i'm totally honored that they're here at peace one day's 20-year celebration to have this discussion it's going to be led by emily cherry who is an extraordinary person a, you know a friend and a great supporter of peace one day and we're really honored to have her hosting this panel you will be meeting afua nakanza asamoa who is the child net youth advisory board member. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. To Mohammed Dagam, who's ChildNet Youth Ambassador and Youth Advisory for the Project to Shame. Well done. Thank you for coming. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Ashua Parkinson, founder Voices Beyond Divisions and Diana Award holder. Thank you very much. To In Our Live, who is uh, an absolutely amazing man and is actually a real inspiration for the reason why we got so far involved in the cyberspace. But he's the Associate Pro Professor of Data Science at Tallinn University of Technology and Research uh, and also a part of the Oxford University Centre for Technology and Global Affairs. There's nothing he didn't know about the cyberspace. <laughs> so it's going to be great to have him here. And of course, Judith Cunningham, who is the Founder and Chief Strategy Officer at the Montessori Model United Nations. Thank you, Judith. It's been amazing working with you over these years. And Lauren Lefebvre, who is the founder of the Breck Foundation, set up to educate and empower children online. Thank you for being here. Well, you're in for a very interesting conversation. Emily, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And what an inspiration to be here, not only in Shakespeare's Globe, in this beautiful San Wanamaker Theatre, but particular welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We really want you to be able to join in on the conversation. So please follow Peace One Day on Twitter, on Instagram, and on all our channels, and make sure that you're using the hashtags Do Your Peace and Cyber Nonviolence. That's hashtag Cyber Nonviolence to join in the conversation. So what an honour to be here today with these incredible panellists so that we can debate this issue. As Jeremy 
Jeremy so eloquently has explained, you know, online violence is something that we all know people around the globe are experiencing and it's something that today we hope will be able to flood the online world with messages of hope, with love, with respect. And if you've got that opportunity, please get online and use the online world in a positive way. But to debate this issue, thank you so much for joining me, panellists, uh, in this air. I think we'd like to start with the, the really first question here. So we called this panel, is cyber violence the cost of being online? Is it something we're simply starting to accept? So let me start, please, with you, Afua. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so you've been a really passionate campaigner and advocate through your work with Childnet International, a fantastic organisation um, who've been doing lots of work on something called Project D-Shame, so I hope you can describe that to our audience. And through that, you've really um, heard so many young people's experiences of sexual harassment and sexual violence experienced online. Um, do you think that we've just started to simply accept it's the cost of going online now? Um online sexual harassment and online sexual violence should not be acceptable and it is not acceptable um, and this is because the people who are online are the people who are in the world and who are offline and since we do not accept violence offline we should not accept violence online in any way shape or form um, th in this world like we have various organizations who have been working so hard um, to really see that violence offline, well just violence in the world, is decreased and in the same way that's what this The Shame project was about, to create a safer online world for young people. And I guess what was really different about this project was speak, um, putting young people at the centre to really ask them what are your experiences. So in England and across the whole of UK about um, 1,600 respondents took an online survey um, about the, uh, about the experiences online to do with bullying, to do with sexual harassment um, and just how they relate with other people online. Um, and what this has allowed us to do was to influence policy, um, which is really good So um, to do with like white papers, but to also talk to people in different industries. So the big gurus and um, Facebook, Google, to have some conversations about that, but to also to speak to the police speak to the criminal prosecution service about how young people actually really feel um, and all of this was to the end to enable young people report more um, and also just understand some of the barriers around reporting so it wasn't like um, a bunch of older people were in a room speaking about young people's experiences but young people actually telling um, older people what was going on and that's what really helped us make really great resources for, sh um, for teachers as well. I mean, it, it's so powerful. We're right now in the middle of a global movement of young people coming together across the world to talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. I think what you were saying there about kind of young people being right at the heart of things. I mean, Judith, you know, as, as the Montessori Schools Network um, all over the world, um, and you've got this absolutely incredible program with the Model UN, um, and you'll be doing some work with Peace One Day later on next year mm -hmm. to look at the issue of cyberbullying. But as sort of um, your, your classroom staff and kind of educationalists, they're working in the classroom, is the online world creating an issue, both positive or negative, in the classroom itself? It's not the online world that is the problem. It's how it's being used. Uh, any tool can be, I, I just heard the past panelists say any tool, I don't think she was talking about a tool, but she was talking about anything can be used as a sword or as a shield. And in this case, what we're seeing with cyberbullying is that it has devastating effects. I was impressed yesterday to see there were 100,000 young people marching for climate change here in London. Across the world, four million people struck for climate change. For young people, this is the number one existential problem. But if you think about those four million people yesterday, one out of every two has been cyberbullied. And the other one has either been a witness to it, knows someone who is part of it, or knows a perpetrator. So uh, on a personal and emotional level, cyberbullying is probably the number one problem that children experience. So what happens? Well, the, on the emotional level, or the psychological level, first of all, you feel a victim. You feel helpless, powerless, depressed. And cyberbullying just doesn't go away because there's no face-to-face -face contact. It's anonymous, it's 24-7. And so the rate of suicide of young people is twice that of those for those who've been cyberbullying. There are physiological effects. Kids will stop eating. They will stop going to school. 
they're depressed. They withdraw from social relationships. In school, they don't want to bring attention to themselves, so they tend to isolate, limit their friendships in the classroom. They're less likely to volunteer or participate. It impacts their grades. And so all in all, it is, has an impact on the capacity of these young people to be the people that they were meant to be. And so there is a measurable impact on the potential for our society. So it, it is devastating. And I, I think what's particularly disturbing is that very few countries have laws against cyberbullying. They say we can assume cyberbullying, other headlines, you know, other types of laws, but for governments and for schools to stand up and to recognize the level of um, this problem and the importance for students to realize that they have a right to safety. They have a, a, um, a right to feeling that in their schools they can be safe and protected. I think that kind of global call that you were making there around um, cyberbullying and to ensure that we're all working together globally um, to recognise the effects of cyberbullying is such a powerful point. So, Asha, you've won a Diana Award, um, which are the awards uh, in memory of the late Princess Diana, um, for really inspirational young people who do such inspirational things. Um, so your award was working with around music. Um, we're in a beautiful venue um, where lots of music will be performed later on. If you can catch the live stream later, you'll see some of that music. Um, and that's been working with children of different ethnic minorities. Um, so social media can sometimes feel like a real flood of negativity, um, particularly towards different groups uh, and those, uh, those with difference, and particularly about responses to world events. Do you think the online can be helpful or hindering sometimes your, kind of your work, really, in that area? I think it can definitely be both. Um, with, with on, with the online world it is really an extension of human consciousness and what humans are feeling anyway. And um, through Voices Beyond Divisions, I, I mean, my initial idealism as a, as a kid who'd grown up in this um, age of technology was that I'd have a sort of video of these kids singing that people would see on social media. That would be something really refreshing that would um, give people a vision for how a world could function beyond divisions, beyond divisions of class, religion and cultural differences. And I really wanted to share that message of the world on social media. So often you see people um, responding to any political difficulties or any social difficulties quite angrily on social media. And I wanted to really tackle that in a fresh and, fresh and creative way. And through something that isn't actually technology, that is singing, that's something that all kids can do and all kids can be united in. And, um, you know, it's, it was just amazing just seeing how that, that, that voice that they, that they have together just, just goes beyond their, their divisions. And, for, uh, it, and, you know, I use social media to share that a lot once when it was happening and sharing the video, sharing the footage. And that really helped, and I, I, got, no, I got no negative responses from it. That's partly to do with um, the profile of it. I'm sure if it were more high profile, it would have got more of a negative response, as, as is always the case because um, of, the, of um, the great problem we have of trolling. But I, I think that um, as someone who's living in the digital age, I have to use technology in a positive way and spread my idealism and the idealism I'd like to instill in others through that. Great to hear some positive examples, particularly around uh, creativity and, and music, um, particularly. We're very keen on music at Peace One Day as an activity, so Set for Peace is something. <laughs> we hope lots of people will be joining in later on in the day um, all around the globe. So let's go back and think about um, ChildNet uh, and particularly the role of Project DeShame. So Mohammed, you've been so significantly involved in this program, um, which uh, lovely Afua spoke to us a little bit earlier about. Um, and you've created this toolkit, which uh, I think is called Speak Up, Stay Safe. Um, uh, step in up, there? Step up, up, speak up. Yeah. That's the one. Uh, thank you. That's good correction. <laughs> um, so in that work, what have ChildNet really been, uh, children from ChildNet, been telling you about their experience of online abuse and trolling? And harassment? Um, well, I'm part of the uh, ChildNet Youth Advisory Board and, and in the Youth Advisory Board we have a, a really unique advantage in that we are 10 uh, youth ambassadors from across the UK, um, from Sunderland to Southampton, we're, you know, we're all over and therefore we have meetings and then um, we go back to our areas and we kind of talk to young people and, kind of, and then collate um, 
information and then come back and meet uh, once more and then talk about um, the what we found and how the differences in cyberbullying between um, and online violence and mainly it's uh, online sexual har harassment that we're trying to tackle um, between these different areas and uh, this kind of gives us like a a, uh, a first hand uh, so we know what's going on firsthand uh, because we're actually de there speaking to young people, um, you know, we're their peers, and so it's n there's not that barrier that there is um, between a uh, an adult and a young person. Um, and what we found is actually quite staggering. Um, the statistics that we've built up um, on uh, Step Up Speak Up on the uh, what we've collected, the statistics are actually quite staggering. Like, um, fifty percent of young people have um, se sent a, a nude photo of themselves. Um, twenty-five percent, I think it was twenty-five or twenty-six percent of young people have faced online uh, sexual harassment. You know, these are uh, quite staggering statistics, um, and one wonders whether it may be even higher than that. This is just like the base. Um, so th that's what we've f found from being with young people, and as I've said, it's a unique advantage that we have that we're you know, we're also young people, and so we can speak to them as their peers and get um, the information and to k to widen our um, understanding of it, and then come together and create we create um, toolkits that teachers can use, and then dissipate them across like the UK. So that toolkit can be found at the ChildNet yeah. website yeah. Um, and people can download that particularly for teachers. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, so Lauren, um, absolute pleasure to, to be with you here today. Um, so I'd really like to turn to the role of parents. So we've talked about educators, we've talked about young people, but in terms of parents, so many people will be familiar with your story, um, but I know there'll be many people online who will be hearing it for the first time. Um, now Lauren's uh, son, Brett, Breck Bedner, who was 14 years old, was groomed online through a predatory uh, r relationship in 2014 and incredibly tragically through that relationship, Breck was murdered. Um, now your response as a family and as a mother to that complete heartbreak um, has been, I don't, we don't know how you do it. We are so, so, so proud of you um, and how you've responded to that because you've set up through this family tragedy a, a new charity which is about empowering and educating children online to be safe online and to use Breck's story for good. I had the pleasure of coming to the play um, which is now available uh, for teachers to be able to use in schools and to go around the country to get Breck's story out there. Mm -hmm. But Lauren, you know, what more can you know, parents be doing in this area to really um, look for the signs of when a child is in distress and get help for that child? Well, I think, um, you know, obviously parenting children is tricky in any case, but as they go through sort of their stages of using, um, you know, on, online devices, uh, it it's, it's makes it more difficult. So when I think back to when Breck was young, you know, he loved to be online uh, gaming, but originally with his friends. And he did have a passion for music. You know, it can be so healing and uh, inspiring and, and love sport as well. But his true love was computing and gaming. And so I think in some ways he didn't have enough balance in his life as he sort of got to his teen years. Um, but he was actually introduced to his predator through friends of friends from school. And I think that's really key that people recognize that everyone online is a stranger. It doesn't mean they're all bad. It means we don't know who they are. And he hadn't been taught that. So, you know, um, people also didn't recognize that boys could be groomed too. There was a lot of things about grooming that people weren't recognizing the signs. And even when I tried to report and stop it, I struggled to find anybody who could, who could sort of understand what I was saying. So I think especially with the work that, you know, that ChildNet uh, youth um, work, uh, uh, young people are doing is so helpful because like you, like you said, there's more reporting going on. The numbers are up, and as PCC said, more than a third, and on Instagram, cases have more than doubled. That's down to the work that we're all doing collectively to educate, and especially the peer-on-peer. -peer. Uh, young people do listen more readily to someone their own age who gets it, who talks the talk. And so um, that's why we have uh, our our play game over and our film Breck's Last Game and Breck Ambassadors that are volunteer police cadets because I think it resonates more than 
a mom that you know feels like I'm nagging at them, but we do our we do our best. So I think for me, um, sort of parental advice, and you know we hear it all the time. It's that all oh, talk to your kids, but talk to them in a way that's more engaging, that isn't talking at them, but speaking with them. And that's why we think with Breck's story, it, it resonates because he was an everyday schoolboy spending time online. Uh, he had you know friends and he had a family who cared about him, yet he didn't see those dangers. So I think with using you know Breck's and other sort of real life stories. Uh, it helps in teaching our young people to respect and value, you know, each other. When we look at all the horrible sort of knife crime that's been happening, and I think, you know, on a day like today, we need to remember that whilst we're talking to everyone, we kind of all agree with each other that it's important to educate and talk and use peer on peer. It's so many things. We actually do have to reach out further afield because there will be some parents and people who aren't listening who need us and people like us to sort of mentor and you know some people are out there screaming for help to be motivated and to be empowered so um, I think that's really important that we use Breck's story as an, in an inspirational way and we hope that the lessons will be learned so that no other child will face the sort of issues that he did. Well it, it's such an inspiration to, to hear you speak Lauren and um, we're having messages from all around the world so thank you keep them to come in you know people saying that this is uh, just a great day to talk about peace and lots of positivity for, for the panelists so thank you so much and thank you for those of you to send those comments in and get on that hashtag flood the internet with messages of hope and messages of peace today. Um, so, I feel uh, given that we have, uh, we've got parents on the panel um, and we've got young people on the panel, um, you've heard Lauren talk about, and particularly there to kind of parents rally and cry to get alongside um, your children and do it in a much more engaging way. What do you think are the important lessons for online parenting that every parent watching right now should know <laughs> <laughs> as a young person? Um, well, at ChildNet, what we really, really love to do was to have these cross-generational conversations and really have a space where you're really open with certain experiences. So I'll give an example. Um, we spoke to the Criminal Prosecution Service um, at one point and it was such a lovely experience to see that they truly didn't sometimes understand the perspective that we were coming from. So yes, we did speak to them as prosecutors, but we also spoke to them as parents um, to understand why, for example, someone would decide to post a nude picture of themselves. Um, and they thought it was like really absurd. Um, and to use it, like in law terms, they were like, oh, why would you publish a picture of yourself? And we said, like, it's not really publishing. It's just like, you know, putting up a picture. And I guess for most of the young people who are digitally native, growing up with um, um, having a tablet since you're young and being online, this is part of your life. And for most adults, you had the internet come to you. So there's a clear divide and thus, um, and thus like you have certain boundaries that you put in place. Um, so f in understanding how to really know what to do um, as a parent is to really empower your children, like you're saying, Laurie, um, to understand the importance of boundaries. But this has to be an ongoing discussion that's, that has happened from way young to understand boundaries like, oh, if for example, a friend says something that's not nice i would not be friends with that person but also understand that these conversations also extend all the way to if someone does something online maybe i would probably block them um, and having these open conversations so everyone can understand on both sides and um, you also spoke about the peer-to-peer -peer discussions and um, as part of these shame we also worked with hungary and denmark and what was interesting cultural differences was that uk um, young people were more open to speak to their friends um, while in Denmark they were more open to report to their parents so sometimes um, culturally there's some maybe boundaries about being open with certain private issues and it's all about um, creating a really good space um, to have certain conversations basically. So just think, I'd, I'd like to pick up on that point really and bring in Judith um, from a Montessori Schools Network. So I think that was really interesting what Afil was just saying there about kind of different cultural way, uh, ways that people deal with it with parenting. Do you think also from a teaching perspective and kind of educators perspective, is this in any of your schools, do you think in any of the countries that you work in, is it different in some countries? Are they getting it better than we're getting it in the UK or worse? That's, that's an excellent question. I think in more authoritarian societies, um, there's probably less discussion among the parents. I would say in um, more in the West, where relationships between parents and children um, are deemed to be really important, and there's more support for it. But I think really we're all at a point where 
let's say my parents were in discussing sex when I was an adolescent, where it was a topic they knew they needed to talk to me about, but they really didn't have the tools. So uh, I think it's, uh, it behooves parents and schools to be able to share with parents, how do you speak to your children? How, what you talked about setting boundaries, understanding how you can monitor your child's online presence, having discussions about what is a friend? What is a global, what does a digital global citizen look like? What are those characteristics? And I think that's almost like a course in itself, a, a subset of parenting that we need to give these tools to our parents. And the best place for that to happen, in general, is schools. And unfortunately, many schools um, are limited in their ability to provide these kind of parenting tools. So um, in our programs, in Montessori Model UN, we do workshops for teachers and parents. And that is one of the workshops that we'll be doing in, in conjunction with the Cyberbullying Committee. Do, can I speak about that for a minute? So um, we run a Montessori M a Model UN program, and I'm sure many of you have heard of Model UN. It's typically designed for high school and, and university students. Our program um, engages students as young as nine and as old as 15, because we believe that's the age of social justice. Typically, students represent countries other than their own and talk about global problems. We're doing a special committee this year with, with Jeremy and with Emily, that's cyberbullying. And we're bringing students from all over the world. Every, um, may, every continent will have representation to understand, first of all, from them, what is the nature of cyberbullying? What is their experience? What are their ideas on what solutions should be in place for governments, for tech companies, for parents? And how do we prevent it? All of that will be compiled. They'll create resolutions. We'll ac they'll actually present their resolutions in the General Assembly of the UN in March. And then we're going to share that as a kind of white paper with the UN, with governments, with families, and every other interested person, because we believe that it is you who are the experts. And you need to be our teachers in this. And we need to help you find the resources to be able to know what is acceptable, what isn't, what to do when, when you do need help without retaliation. So we're really thrilled to bring these um, 60 young people together in New York, and then we're doing it again in Rome. So um, I think we'll have some really good information when we're finished. I'm so excited to be partnering with uh, Model UN um, next year. I think the resolution and the work that we do will be fantastic. In fact, uh, I think we should give a shout out to because I think it's next week, in fact, that the uh, Australian eSafety Commissioner is doing the very first preparation session of the teachers to prepare for the Model UN. So talking about the role of government, which means I'd love to then turn to the wonderful Inar, who really does know everything, by the way, about <laughs> computer science and online um, in, in very many ways. Very, 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 very clever. Um, so Inar, um, really do want to talk about government. We're hearing constantly in the media about the negative influence of online. We've had uh, scandals, Cambridge Analytica. We've had um, public concerns about data and the way that everything's being regulated. We know in the UK alone that they are looking at um, a government white paper that's potentially coming. Um, later on down the track in the next parliament. But do you think there's a place for technology to improve government itself and, and the role of technology in really kind of improving everything for society, so the positive side as well? Absolutely. I think uh, technology has already helped, but of course technology is only in a way like a tool to amplify whatever we anyway, uh, who we are. And so basically whatever, if we do something negative, it will amplify us and, and, and vice versa as well. But I think, uh, like you just uh, mentioned, Cambridge Analytica, then typically uh, data has been used uh, so far uh, mostly for, let's say, advertising purposes and, uh, and also uh, you know, political purposes. Right? But I think, uh, still think that it shouldn't be uh, you know, disallowed just to use data and store data because we, we must understand that uh, whenever we, uh, we interact with other people, our friends, whenever we interact with computers, machines, or the government, then we always leave those uh, small uh, data trails uh, everywhere. And, uh, and just uh, not allowing to use that would be you know, like a too simple s solution. But we should really think that, uh, uh, that 
now that we know that all those data points are there, either they are in, you know, uh, when, we, when we chat, uh, maybe our Fitbits uh, record something, uh, you know, our, our heart rate goes up or something like that. The question would be that, uh, that all those uh, negative uh, phenomena we want to minimize, uh, how can we, uh, where, does, where is data stored? So basically, how can we get data from here, from there, from third places, how can we take that together and start to, start to notice, either notice negative things or, or notice people who, who need, to be, need to be noticed. And, but if we think about uh, technology, then the typical uh, story goes that we, we should, uh, about, uh, if we think about uh, hate speech or, or detecting uh, misinformation, uh, then, then I, I really think that, uh, that, the, uh, that the focus should be not so much in, in detecting uh, uh, misinformation, but, uh, but detecting miscommunication. That actually, uh, it was also mentioned here that we shouldn't be only basically thinking about how to minimize negative things, but actually how to, how to, how to bring everybody, everybody up. And, and, if, and this is actually a, po a place where, where technology in, in, uh, in large scale uh, can help. Because all those, uh, you know, either bit, uh, violence between people, between organizations, between states, they all often start from uh, miscommunication. And if we could really uh, develop uh, wonderful uh, technologies, tools, uh, which would identify, you know, that now there was this miscommunication, then I think that would help. Of course, miscommunication is also the basis often for creativity. And this is needed, so that uh, this small, small uh, details of miscommunication, but, but in general, I think, uh, this is, uh, this is a place, so I think the data will be one of the core issues what we have to, uh, what we have to think about is, is how to notice basically that, that what are those digital uh, the data trails which are left behind in, in cyberbullying and, and all those issues. Well, what's lovely right now is that uh, people online are giving us lots of love and likes. Um, so I'm feeling the peace and the love uh, for the, what the panel is definitely talking about here. So you know, thank you to those of you kind of online. Um, you know, just a kind of a follow-up question about that because I think I'm I'm really interested in the way that um, data and particularly ca technology can be used in miscommunication. So do you think there's a much greater role then, particularly on the social media platforms, when you think about online and the ways that we speak online, for getting people to maybe stop, pause and rethink before they post something? Is that something that you think would be of benefit? Or, or Absolutely. Uh, of course, I think the, uh, all those misinformation campaigns, that they should be, it should be uh, redistinguished, whether it's uh, just uh, miscommunication or misinformation between two people, or somebody is uh, basically building a, a campaign, a coordinated campaign of uh, I don't know, uh, some violent information, then I think that uh, first is easier to t detect and should be detected, but, but uh, the second one, of course, uh, should, uh, should also be addressed. But, uh, but I, uh, I really think that, uh, that uh, um, social media, uh, uh, can have a role like uh, basically all those next layers of, of technology can have a role like uh, we currently use, let's say, glasses just to see better or, or basically uh, so that we can use technology as an as amplifier that we then we, we understand better because the attention span is, is basically going, going smaller all the time. So, so we need some tools like we used uh, you know, microscopes or we use, uh, we use glasses. We, we need some similar tools for for communication. Great, thank you. Um, so we've, uh, we've all been talking uh, backstage and over in the media over the last 24 hours about the big climate change protests that have been happening around the world organised by Greta Thunberg and the incredible um, movement that she has created with her voice. But I'm also really aware that Greta's been trolled online. She's been subjected to some really vile abuse from adults um, who disagree, and from, from other young people and uh, or people all around the world who disagree with her views. So Judith, do you think that the way that social media and the way that we treat those in public life, so those that put themselves, are, it might be our politicians, it might be our celebrities, do you think that creates a different way that young people think about those in public life and how they can interact with them? Absolutely. They're role models and they're setting a standard to say it's okay to bully and it's okay to use the, the internet as a platform for bullying. 
And so we have a bigger job to do as, as parents, as educators, as um, uh, workers and foundations, as musicians. And I think that's what's so incredible about what's happening here today. All of us are putting our talents towards creating a more peaceful world. Um, earlier there was a panel that had um, um, politicians from different uh, across Europe and the EU. Tonight there are going to be musicians and performers and um, artists all bringing their particular talent to help us understand how do we create a peaceful world. And so how to offset those negative images that are out on the internet I think is critical in bringing to children's attention the power of what the positive can be. I want to say one last thing. When I came here today, I saw this boat that's called the Ship of Tolerance. And when I first saw it, I saw the paintings of children on it. And I thought, how beautiful. This must be the love boat. But no, it's the Ship of Tolerance. There's a big gap between tolerance and love. And that gap is about understanding and respect. And I think, you know, behind every bully, there's, there's a problem. There's a social behavior problem. And trying to overcome and uh, uh, overpower and threaten people. And so how do we look behind that to see how were those social um, bad behaviors learned? Because no child is born a bully. No politician is born a bully. So how are these people growing up? to believe that using violence and bullying is acceptable. So I'm bringing forth more questions and answers to you, but I think I'm so proud to be here today to be part of this and showcasing to the world about all the people who have come together to focus on what peace can look like. Well, I mean, this is just another call out to those of you um, out there online. You can be part of this change today on Peace Day. Um, we are, as Jeremy mentioned right at the start, if you were here at the start of the panel, we're working with Digitalist, Social360 and Signal, and also Hatebase as well, who are based out in Can Canada, to be looking at the language that people are using online today. Flood the online world for us today. Flood it with messages of love, of respect, of hope, of real positivity so that we can see that change today on Peace Day. And I know we've also just had a question in as well um, from Twitter, which is very much focused on whether technology companies should be and could be doing more in this area. So, Lauren, I know you've had some difficult experiences and you've been in the room many times with a lot of these tech companies. So do you think they could or should be doing more? I definitely think they should be, and I think that we need to collectively force them. You know, it's, it's not just parents and educators, but we need government, we need everyone to help to get uh, social media companies, gaming you know, platforms to take responsibility for what's happening on their platforms. They are making profits, and you know, we're not trying to stop that, but we want them to use those profits to make the platforms as safe as possible. And when I think about how young people are told to report and taught to talk about things that are happening, I've found that a lot of them, if they're uh, getting bullied or trolled um, online and they report it, there are times when police just can't deal with the amount of, of cases that they have to deal with. And I've had children say, well, why bother to report? And I think that's the last thing we want to do is instill that it, nothing happens when they make that report. And that's why I think every one of those cases needs to be taken seriously. Um, just recently, it was, it was um, only possible to investigate those cases by police going to the U.S., to those corporates, mm -hmm. to gather the evidence. And um, um, I worked and with my team uh, with previous Home Secretary uh, Sajid Javid to change that policy. And now, actually, for police all over the U.K., it is possible for them to gather evidence from those companies based in the U.K. They all have all of the social media platforms. Game. They will have offices based here rather than waste all this time going to the U.S. And so that's something that I really want to share because people don't know it's such a new development that we need people to be listened to. And like you said, there will always be bullies, people who troll. I, I don't get it myself, but in our whole own family case, the person that was arrested uh, had several mobile devices. So this is a person that wasn't just trolling our family. They're obviously, it's something that they like to do. So it's going back to parenting, trying to get young people to understand that it hurts, whether it's online or face to face, and, and trying to find a more positive you know, uh, way for young people to go. There has to be something better they can use with their time. And that's what we want social media companies, gaming uh, platforms to make sure that they are stopping this with artificial intelligence, more human assessors. And I know that human
human assessor job is, is extremely difficult, but we then we need to train more people to spot these signs of grooming, exploitation, trolling and bullying before it affects the child. So what about from a young person's perspective? So, um, Asha, um, do you think the technology companies are doing enough? Would you like them to be doing more? I certainly don't think they're doing enough. And, um, I mean, there's often obviously great financial implications in that. Um, and it's, it, it's really got to be at the heart of what they're doing to make sure that what, what, what they're doing is, is not damaging to young people. And constantly um, checking up on controls and things. There's, I mean, I'd say that the internet is really a wild west complete wild west in terms of laws it's, it's it's an international world that has been created that we have no control over and um really you know it's a it's such a gray area like especially sexual um harassment online because because the laws that we have in society aren't sort of instilled onto the internet correctly we haven't got the controls yet so a lot of young people actually become victims of online grooming and don't realise they're victims because this seems like such a world of fantasy to them. But um, the corporations definitely have a responsibility to, to be aware of the laws that, uh, inter uh, international laws and just international moral standards um, for, for young people because I, I, don't think, I don't think that growing up in, in school I was taught enough about um, about about the online world, and I, don't, I think that's the same for a lot of people. A lot of us don't know what's out there. It is a wild west. I mean, it's quite staggering to think it's a it's an example that's been used many times over the years. But you can't create a children's playground in the physical world without going through the jumps and the hoops, and rightly so, from safety features and standards. But yet, the same doesn't exist for the online world um, with game sites, apps that children can play and contact and, and others as well. Um, so technology companies, uh, rightly, governments are looking to them now as well. But in our, from a, a kind of a, a global government perspective and working together, um, are there sort of data barriers and, and, and things that just would prevent from some of that from really happening in a way without huge cost and regulation across the globe. Is this something we can do in one country and then another country and another country or is it a global approach that we need to really be advocating? I think that uh, of course it would be easier <laughs> if we could have a global approach but uh, uh, as uh, you know most probably it will continue to be that we have to do it separately in every country either than if there is a Specific, uh, some deals are argued between the the, the, the case with uh, with uh, the social media UK and US. But uh, I think that uh, another uh, huge issue, if we think about regulation, uh, is that uh, at one point those uh, large tech companies are already larger than very many countries. So it's it's almost as as asking that uh, that uh, should US or UK do more. That, that if, if they are already as big as countries, then basically that, that's another issue. That whether whether we should at one point uh, start to uh, communicate with the tech companies as if they were they were they were countries. But, uh, but if we if uh, if I think about uh, those examples uh, uh, spoken recently, then then I think uh, still that uh, the power of technology could come from uh, from scaling up uh, human performance. There was this uh, uh, claim earlier that, uh, that uh, police is unable to you know, spot all those small details. Uh, and or, uh, but I, th I think that this could be the case where, where actually technology can come in and help that, that if, if uh, you know, there are all those small details which, which you know, if you put them all, all puzzle pieces together, actually there is a case. And, and typically uh, the, it's, it's much uh, harder to spot uh, the details, but, uh, but uh, the cores of the problem are already, basically, those are the things which, which people, people have, to, to have, have to handle. And, and uh, if I think about, uh, if I, but if, if you ask about uh, the data being all around uh, uh, the world, then I think that's, uh, that's an ongoing, uh, ongoing problem. Uh, how do you, basically, one thing is who owns the data, second, second question is that how, uh, how can we access the data and how quickly? Because if, if there's an you know, emergency issue, can we just depend on some official notes that, that please, would you, would you give access uh, to that information? But, uh, but at, the sa at the same time, a, l a lot of things can be done locally. Uh, with, the, with this example of uh, uh, you know, seven mobile phones being at home, again, this, uh, this definitely leaves traces. The, the question is now that 
and this is a societal question, not so currently even uh, even technological or, or legal, that that should uh, maybe those kind of issues be rep uh, reported to somebody. If we can see that uh, that the last ten negative cases all had this common uh, thing of having, you know, five plus phones at home, that, uh, I think it, it should raise a raise a question. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Um, so I'm going to try something that's slightly different, which I didn't didn't uh, warn any of you about. Um, Raise your hand if you are on a social media platform. I am. Everyone, that's good. Um, raise your hand if you've read every single word of the terms and conditions of that social media platform. <laughs> I know I haven't. <laughs> and uh, I think by consensus and agreement there that none of my fellow panellists have. Um, do you think it's the user that needs to be responsible for the behaviour and the language that we use online? Or do you think it needs to be part and parcel of the terms and conditions and uh, what we sign up to when we're on that platform? Mohammed, do you have a, a view on that? Well, certainly um, your own responsibility not to uh, kind of be causing harm to others. Like, you wouldn't do so uh, in person. So, um, you, you know, try not to do so uh, online. So it's definitely, you know, you should, um, it's, it's the person's own responsibi responsibility to be doing so. Uh, however, there should be in terms and conditions, which I think there are in most um, social media outlets, that if you are causing uh, harm or abuse or, you know, online violence, that you should be, uh, you know, you, you, you can report them and, um, you know, uh, profiles can be taken down. So I think in that respect, uh, w the social media outlets are, we'll give it to them there. They're doing, uh, they're doing quite well on that one. Um, however, in, in other uh, respects, I think they could be uh, doing more. Yeah. Well, the problem is people who get shut down will just minutes later open yeah. up another yeah. account, yeah. and that's with terrorists and radicals, all, all sorts. And that's, I still think that there would be a common link. You mm. might be the tech brain, there would be some common link that they could start to link up people who were constantly opening uh, accounts and having them shut down because they were uh, posting inappropriate content or harmful content. And, uh, and we, we need more push to that. that. Absolutely. I think that uh, basically one thing w what we could tell the, the tech companies is, is to give, give some like, design guidelines that uh, basically how can they design or what's the, what's the, how can they design their experience of being online so t that it would minimize uh, violence. Mm -hmm. that, uh, even, uh, some, some, uh, some aspects probably are uh, that even, that so, for, for example, some online, uh, online media allows you to send photos without permission, and then you have to block them afterwards. But again, what if, it, what if they would have to get, uh, you know, basically you to accept the message before and then get, the, get this message? Of course, this has some financial reasons uh, and, this, uh, and, and helps to grow the grow the system, but at the same time, uh, all those small design, uh, design uh, issues and, and basically design guidelines could actually uh, you know, uh, do yeah, make it happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that safety by design approach is definitely, I know the um, Australian eSafety Commissioner's Office have just uh, issued their guidance around what safety by design looks like from a child safety perspective, so certainly growing a momentum. And we were coming in the yeah. back side of it. We, we yeah. didn't start it from the no. beginning, and that's, yeah. that's the, it's the wrong way, isn't it? Yes. It's absolutely the wrong way around, isn't it? So we've had another question in from um, YouTube, um, which is back to, I think, something that Judith was talking about earlier, but I'd really like to take Afua's view. Um, so we've had, uh, we've had all of our world leaders uh, constantly now on Twitter. Um, a lot of our, our role models in society are always on Twitter and other social media platforms expressing their views, not all of them in the way that we at Peace One Day would say is a peaceful form of communication and a respectful form of communication. So when children are in school and they're seeing that, how hard do you think it is for teachers to be able to um, you know, constantly be saying to them, uh, be a role model, be nice, don't bully, and then they see this is how the political leaders are behaving? Um, it's quite hard, <laughs> of course, um, because of course as a young person, remember you're growing up um, and what you see is what you think is normal. And if no one is giving you what is the positive, you just see the negative as the norm. Um, and so seeing people do policies and diplomacy on Twitter, um, but in a really, really harsh way, um, you probably just think, 
I don't know, it's, it, it, it's, it sets a bad standard basically. And, and if no one really is actively calling people out in it, unconsciously or subconsciously for loads of young people, because you're growing up, you just probably just think, oh, this is fine. Um, and so it, it, it takes a lot more um, intentionality and people being, and teachers being quite conscious to say, no, this is not how it's done. And of course, positive role models who are doing and saying um, appropriate things online um, so teachers can point to them and say that this is um, a good way to actually talk and, and actually um, behave online as, as is appropriate. Yeah. Um, so do you think, uh, and again it's another question that's come in from YouTube, so do you think governments of the world should be really kind of customising their approach to cyberbullying so in their country so that would take in account of kind of local uh, context, um, local culture, local values, local laws, um, is that something that you think governments should do? I don't know, Judith, do you have a view given your um, work? Violence and harassment mm. are universal. We all know what they look like no matter what the colour of our skin, what god we worship um, or where we live we all know what it looks like i think there's a universality to this you know m my hope would be that this could be a discussion at the united nations where you know 193 member states could sit and talk about this now we all know that the un is more or less effective sometimes very ineffective particularly about things that impact of all of us but i think having that discussion on international level to understand the common ground and how it impacts everyone everywhere um, you know there's one other thing that i, I want to bring to this because this is about a culture of violence and harassment and we've been talking about it from the point of view of the victim because they're in front of us and we have tremendous empathy and compassion and a motivation to make things different. But you know, many of the people who are the bullies, uh, the cyber bullies, were once victims. And so this becomes a cycle if it isn't stopped. And how can we uh, even identify, before they become cyber bullies, what, what are the characteristics of young people or even adults that would lead them into such antisocial behavior to threaten, harass, um, and lead, lead to ultimate violence of death. So I think there, there are both sides of this question that we have to look at. F and, that's for, and that really does involve governments. It, it does. Lo Lauren, do you think there's um, enough support out there, particularly for young people these days, so um, coming up through the system, that if they are struggling with, with issues, that there's enough support, and the online world has kind of become that place where you can describe and express oh, yourself more? We do a lot of work with sort of different types of communities and people in different situations, and I think, um, you know, no matter how much support uh, that people try to offer if someone is quite vulnerable and has had has gone through a difficult situation with abuse or exploitation They still aren't going to be wrapped in cotton wool and their their behaviors may be Violent or inappropriate themselves because as you said, that's what they've grown up with so I think you know in our case specifically um, Bragg's predator hadn't had the greatest life and maybe hadn't had the most help from sort of social services that could have maybe uh, kept an eye on him or changed the course of action. So I think it is important to remember that actually um, some uh, offenders have had problems in their past and once again if we try to mentor and and look after and support these people we can stop them before they hurt others and I think that's our job to watch out for that as well. Very powerful message, thank you. Um, so we're nearly heading towards the end of the panel, so we've got one final question for all of the panellists, and I think if we, we go right down the panel, starting with you, Judith, um, there at the end, and then ending back here with Lauren. Um, so Peace One Day Today has launched this campaign. It's a campaign that we're going to run, hashtag cyber nonviolence, for the next five years. By 2025, Peace Day is uh, hoping to reach three billion people annually with our global message of ceasefire and unity. Um, and we want to do that as well with the cyber violence campaign and making sure we can see a decrease in negative language, online hate speech and violence online. So people online, you can join in with this as well. So we want everyone to take this pledge. We want people to flood the internet with messages of peace, with love, with hope and respect, to overtake that negative negativity. So I'd like all of the panel to ask, do you answer, sorry, uh, do you think this approach is needed and what would be your hope in five years' time? Um, okay, what a, what a great question. What I love about what's going on here today 
is the common messages that are coming forward about love and respect and compassion, and also the question about who will you make peace with today? Because it is that action <laughs> that creates peace, that peace begins with each of us. Peace is an inside job, and all of us have been hurt or abused or misunderstood. And if there's a way for us to make bring that forward and make peace with that person or that situation, whether it's in reality, you know, actually, or even our, in our own minds, that enables us to be more peaceful people, and that is a collective experience then. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I remember um, Leima Gaboe, um, the um, Liberian peace activist, I was reading her um, bio, and um, she talked about the mounting of forgiveness, and Part of that is making peace with the perpetrator. Because mm -hmm. once, as, as, as for as long as you have um, feelings of hate towards the person who mm -hmm. committed the crime and you, and you can't forgive, you can't get over it, you can't get over the trauma, and you can't move on from, from whatever the problem has been. And I think that's um, a really important message that we've been talking about today. It's understanding the root causes, addressing, addressing that, and understanding that peace isn't just um, a sort of abstract mood. It's something that's triggered by a lot of external circumstances. And um, my hope for five years' time would just be continued work and continued um, understanding of this. Great, thanks. So Radicalisation. Okay. Mohammed. Yeah, I think it is a, um, should be quite an effective approach. Anything that increases visibility uh, of this um, problem would you know, is, is quite positive. However, I do think that, you know, it needs to be uh, coupled with other things. Um, for example, I think uh, Afua alluded to the fact that in Denmark, that there are, there are um, there's a lower rate of uh, online bullying and online violence. And I think that's mostly due to, and there would be you know, a number of different uh, factors, but also that, um, in Denmark and Scandinavia, they invest far more into uh, uh, social activities for young people. And when a young person has an aim, uh, whether it's uh, you know sports or I think Judith alluded to uh, and Asha alluded to um, uh, singing and music and such, and whether it's uh, academic uh, things, you know, exams and such. When a young person has an aim. Um, I feel like they're less likely. Um, I haven't looked into this. Uh, it's not one of the things we've looked into in the Step Up Speak Up, but from my own uh, experience at school and such, that when, so when a young person has an aim, they're far less likely t to be perpetrators of it. And often, and, and therefore, we can kind of create, and if the, an, a number of people are not perpetrators, then it kind of minimizes the effect of um, online bullying. And also, I'd just like to add, in terms of uh, Lauren alluded to with, with boys, I think boys are often seen, you know, in adolescence, we're often seen as these kind of these um, stoic figures that anything just rubs off us. And um, there's been a lot in the media recently regarding the, ha the number one um, cause of death of young men uh, of under the age of 45 is suicide, and that starts from when you're, you know, that's, that builds up from when you're nine and what you go through then. And so I think when we're talking of online, sex, online sexual harassment in particular, um, it's often aimed at girls when, um, as you can see in Lauren's case, in Lauren's case, it's, you know, it's both genders and it's something that needs to be, uh, ish, uh, needs to be, brought to attention. Lovely said. Thank you, Mohammed. Afua? Um, I think, like May was saying, in terms of visibility, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and, of course, in the right direction means that different things can be built up um, um, and on, on that ground. Um, if this is planned to go for five years, then it will be definitely a strong social media campaign. And of course, if young people are online, because they are online, and they're going to be seeing this for five years, that's like 
I don't know, maybe from an educator's perspective, that's like saying the same message for five years that really leaves a good imprint um, in, to in talking about non-violence and in talking about having really good and healthy communications online. So I think, yeah, it's a really good thing. Thanks for right now. I think something, I think it already the, if, if uh, the initiative of the campaign manages to raise awareness, that basically that about the topic of, uh, of uh, you know, so cyber violence and non-violence, I think even, even already that is a huge thing. Uh, what, uh, if, we, if, we, if we would look back uh, five years, that's, uh, I think that's, that's mo one of the most important things. The secondly, uh, I think uh, you know, the cyber topics also uh, allow uh, other peace topics to be visible uh, uh, for, for younger people. Because you know, if, if they listen to you know, UN's peace talks, you know, maybe 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 that's you know not the best entertainment to look at. <laughs> but but if if you if you then uh, show that you know uh, that also in cyber world, you know, the, all the all the issues, the peace in cyber world, then that's something what they can relate to. And and uh, so even basically even uh, a kid living in a in a, you know, a nice uh, suburb. Of, Florida, they can maybe they don't get what what goes on in you know in Afghanistan or, or other places, but they really understand what uh, what cyberbullying is. So I think that's that's like a perfect link then. Great, Lauren. I think um, you know the, the day today, the celebrations and, and everyone coming together are really amazing. And I think we need to remember it's not just about today or or when we get to five years. Every day we have to you know work on this uh, with our community and, and within ourselves. And when I think of parenting, um, we need to make sure that our young people are using the internet in a, in a positive way, whether it's through gaming or you know, social media apps, teaching them that right from a young age that, that that's how we treat people with respect and, and values. And uh, when I think back to what I used to say, and I still do say, that I just want you know, children to be healthy, happy, and safe, that was sort of my mantra. Well, today I'm adding peace, peace in our hearts and in our lives. <laughs> What a beautiful way to end the panel. Thank you so much. I mean, what uh, incredible panelists that we've had. Um, thank you for your insight, um, your obvious passion for making sure that you know peace is very much part and parcel of, of all of the work and the organisations you represent in your life. Um, don't forget to join us for the rest of the incredible content that we've got here, um, the rest of Peace Days. So we've got Words of Peace at 3.30 coming from this theatre and then an incredible evening show from 7 o'clock. So please stay on the live stream for those um, later on. It'll be live stream will be back so that you can join us for that but it's my absolute pleasure just to say thank you for the final time to this incredible panel thank you so much and happy peace day mm -hmm. <laughs>